We're well, live. My boy George pulled up another local yokel from PV. Just pulled up with the ill red Kangle and some ill red, ill red kicker Roonies. He got, got a box. box What's in the box? I guess we'll find out later. He's a man shrouded in mystery. You never know what he's doing. He could have pulled up in the Resvani, maybe in a Ghost. You never know what he's driving. What are you in today? Watch Dodge Ram. Fucking Ram. <laughs> I knew, <laughs> I knew it. it. <laughs> Yo, you smell great. Yeah, I was just going to say, true. somebody smell good. Fubu cologne. <laughs> oh, wow. My boy's the walking, yeah. tucking plug. What? Fubu Pumas. Those are gas, too. Fubu yeah. Pumas. Yeah, they did a collaboration. The Fumas. Oh, my. Those are gas. I need those for a workout. You got those in a box? About 12 of them in the box. Oh, shit. I'm a size 10. But they're the bosses, not mine. <laughs> You're talking to Mr. Product over here, bro. You know how they get down, the bro. Damon himself. and Georgie. It's just products all day. All right. So I want to start with, for the people who do not know, it all started with, with me, you, and Bryce half drunk in a bar, and you guys walk in. You know what I mean? It's like a, it's like a good punchline to a joke, Facts. but it wasn't a joke. Facts. What'd you say? George wasn't there, bro. Exactly. You weren't there? Nah. Who else was sitting with Damon? I thought, bro, this whole time, I thought you were the one sitting with Damon at that. No, I met you was out here. Yo, I was there for what? that because I wasn't at the bar. Yeah, me neither. I was sitting out there sweating my ass off in a blue suit, looking like a blueberry. Bro. George pulls up. Wow, he's I like, just yeah, got Damon will be here, sizing us up, making phone calls. Facts. I saw them working the magic. He's and then I think George probably said something like, "Yeah, these idiots are cool. You can pull up." <laughs> and then he and then. The shark swam up. Yeah, you were on the phone that with hanging out with us for a while, and Damon was in the car for like 30, 45 minutes. Were you checking us, making sure we were all right? Nope. No? Um, to be honest, I don't even remember. When I got here, <laughs> I, he was already coming. You know what I'm saying? He was already coming. So it wasn't like, yeah, they're okay. They're safe. He already met you. You know what I mean? So yeah, I was yeah. probably talking to somebody else. Probably, or unless I was giving him directions. Got it. But it was, he was coming anyway. Yeah, facts. No, but my my first impression was good. You know, uh, um, Tony was a guy that I, I could tell figure shit out. Whatever it is, he'll figure it out. And I got that vibe from you. That's what I did. And, and very funny. You were making me laugh for a couple of things that you said. Not that I remember what they were, but I remember. Nobody remembers what they are. They just remember yeah. how I made him feel. Yeah, it was good. It was good. And then then young Zach over here. Oh, pimp! He was pimped out, and I was. It was a and the initial vibe. I was like, oh, he's a little full of himself. This kid, you know. But <laughs> as I got to know him and see him, I see a lot of talent and a lot of potential. He's uh, he's gonna do a lot of big things. Thank you, sir. I appreciate yeah. you. Thank you. I've sir. been around talent my whole life, mm -hmm. so I know I know talent when I see it. And then, you know, not initially. I'm like, bang, you know what I'm saying? But like. Yeah, yeah. I got to know you and, and, and watch your stuff and see what you guys do. Yep. And uh, it was dope. And then one of my things I remember clearly was, I was like, what does Q29 mean? And it was like a quarter to the eight quarter, five, to nine. quarter to nine. I'm like, that shit is dope. Right? <laughs> that shit is dope. Right? I like that. Yeah, and I remember that, you know. Who thought of that, Bryce? Was that you? That was an old album we made like 10 years ago when we were doing rap and shit. But it comes from the hip hop roots. We all got those hip hop roots. You know what I'm saying? Like we weren't in the streets of Queens, you know, but like we were still doing it and we respect the hip hop culture. So that like stage name, make up a cool saying that applies to it. That's the kind of world that the Q29 yeah, came bro, from. I was AC from the street to Pleasant Valley. <laughs> you were rapping too? <laughs> yeah, we used to we also <laughs> rap. Yeah. But I held we out. We thought we were a gangster, bro. I grew yeah. up listening to 50 Cent. No. Like, no, thought I was yeah. thogged out mm -hmm. listening to Lloyd Banks on my school bus. Facts. With my, <laughs> with my anti skip CD player. Uh huh. What, are they, what was it called? Like, anti shock? Walkman? Like, Walkman? Nice. That, that correlates a lot, actually, Tony, to like what George does. And George obviously has extensive roots, like, within like the entertainment world. But, uh, like, George, tell us a little bit about what you got going on, like, in the upcoming months with like events and promotions. And tell us a little bit about what you have going on. Well, D keeps me very busy with all of his stuff most of the time, but I still have my side hustle because you got to have a side hustle. And uh, I booked talent for years. Uh, I did everything with talent from uh, being an assistant to working at a record label, servicing DJs, uh, road managing, managing, uh, co-managing, just doing all kinds of things with the artist side of it. And then I went over to, to the um, agency side where... Uh, 
instead of having, you know, three or four acts, there was 30 acts. And it was just a whole different element, but it was a great um, transition from management into, the, into a booking agency. So now I got Jada Kiss and Fabulous coming up on Heavy March 22nd. Hitters. Yeah, it's, it's it, that together. It's the first time I having together. I had Jada a bunch of times and, and my guy. I went to Jada and Fab concert at 50 Front Street in Newburgh five years ago. Get out of here. Was, yeah. it, was the Jason and Freddie theme? Yeah, yeah, Jason yeah, and Freddie yeah. theme. Yeah, we're I went there. We're not doing that, but that's what they were doing at the time. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So, yeah, yeah. They did uh, mad mixtapes together. One? Yeah. We're so, doing it again. They did a lot of mixtapes together for yes, sure. Yes, yeah. exactly. That was that fire vibe. combination. Yeah. Tony, this one's in Philly, Tom. Philly? Yeah. yeah. Philly, yeah. So it's grand reopening for a renovation. Um, the club is over a year. The club never closed, and they just renovated the whole spot over the year. And um, Friday, March 22nd, we're doing that. What's the name of the club? Cheerleaders. Oh, okay. So Cheerleaders, I've been working there for uh, 13, 14 years now. Cheerleaders. We've had everybody. Uh, name drop them. Busta, Uncle Luke, Ooh. Bismarck E, rest in peace, Ooh. Ed Lover. Uh, Where'd you have 50 last? Well, I didn't, I, my guys in, in uh, Big Night up in uh, New England, Boston and the Connecticut area, they had 54 days in a row um, about a month ago. I'm working on, I'm, I'm praying this comes through for 50 in, uh, in December for our holiday parties in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. I've been trying for years. Uh, I did a charity event years ago where one of the other guys involved, he got 50, but I didn't book it personally. But my boy is his road manager, my boy Flav. He's from Queens. Real, real good dude. He's 50s road manager for his tours. Um, but not through him, through the other channels. I'm hoping to get him for Christmas. Be a great Christmas gift for the, mm. for, for the crew. But uh, um, back at Shield is Naughty by Nature, all the old school guys. A lot of, we had Ludacris. Um, hopefully we have Nelly in, Janu in June. There's just, the, the whole we had so it's been 13 years so right. we do you've you know, been everyone rocking parties there so long they and had you're to saying, renovate the joint <laughs> it's crazy you're saying that's your side hustle too and you got all those fucking big names on yeah that's what you're just doing low key that's a sick side hustle bro just working with all that talent oh, you I must got, have I, I, stories i got one quick story about right. fat joe i did fat fat joe like four or five times different charity events nightclubs everything and when during COVID, when he was on Revolt and he came out with that big saying, today's price is not yesterday's price, so yesterday's price is not today's price, whatever the fuck it was, I got that a week before it became famous. Because mm. I tried to book him again in the same club he's done before, where I'm not going to talk about pricing, but where the last time I booked him, and this is the highest I ever paid him, it was a third of what they wanted the next time. Ooh. And his uncle Dan, Dan who handles his business for him now, who I deal with, he, and he told me, he told me that line. And I'm like, so bro, you've been to the club. Price. You know we can't do that. We can't afford that. That's not gonna work. But, you know, he was doing revolt and having, you know. Artists are funny. When they, they need money, they're ready to do it. When they don't need the money, they raise the price. So if you have the money, they're going to do it. Otherwise, they don't need to do it. You know what mm. I mean? So, so he gave me that, you know, yesterday's price, not today's price, George. And he's cool as fuck. The Uncle Dan is cool. We, you know, we've done like, a lot of shows. But the next week, it became famous. Because, you know, Jada did the MSG thing, and he was saying it for Jada. Like, it was just, it just blew up. But I got hit with it before everyone else did. <laughs> That's crazy. You know, it's an interesting business to be in because I think, I don't think there's anybody on the planet with bigger egos than big time rappers. So that's that's an interesting people to deal with and to try and book and, and I think anybody big famous goes. has big egos. But yeah. in a good way too. You know what I mean? Like you can't be that without that. You of course. Like, you have to. You have to. So it's all yeah, about it goes hand it's in all hand. about, you know, bottom line, how it works. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm happy to have Joe for those shows I had and he's a really good dude. He is funny as fuck. Real down to earth and um, I heard he's rebranding to Lap Band Joe. <laughs> I know. That's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, you might have got yeah. the sleeve, or it's the Lap Band. What do you get? I don't. I have uh, no idea. Yeah. I'm only kidding. But when he had the when when he had the vest on and no shirt on, one one of the uh, I think it was the hip hop 50 year anniversary Yankee Stadium. I was like, that's a little crazy. <laughs> but he did it. 
He he's, he's Fat Joe. He can do whatever the fuck he wants. Yeah. Yeah. He's a good dude and puts on a great show and has been doing like you know, it's it's not easy to stay relevant for thirty years. Yeah, that's tough. It's very difficult. And, you know, what I mean? very like, difficult. Very few have done it. Yep. And that's because Joe's been a boss. Like he's been a boss the, behind the scenes the entire time, even when he came out with Pond. Facts. Right. And like he was like handling a lot of the operations for Pond. And even though Pond was the big thing, I mean, I know you know about this too, but like I'm just saying for the people listening, like. Uh, there was a lot going on with Pun, and then when Pun died, like Fat Joe kind of like took that spot. But the so there was a nightclub. It was a nightclub called the Fever in the Bronx, and it was like the first hip hop club. Fat Joe was a promoter and booked Biggie, because my friend Sal Abitello is the owner of Fever. Sal's a, uh, a pioneer in hip hop. He he was one of the first nightclub. He was the first real hip hop nightclub in the Bronx back in the day where when people came in, they literally had to put their guns at like coat check and you'd get it on the way out. Like, That's correct. Would you have the SIG <laughs> yeah. or were you rocking the Glock? <laughs> Sal Abitello, look him up. Real G in the game. So at the Fever, Fat Joe promoted Biggie's first concert in the Bronx. Wow, which is crazy. And do you story. remember at that time, like, was Biggie already like a huge, like a huge, like street legend at that no, time? No, no, it was the beginning. So he was still sort of unknown, Biggie Small. Yep. And okay, and I know not to ask you years anymore. You always smack yeah. me for asking. Years, years are tough. Yeah, years are tough. You guys crazy. So yo, do you remember <laughs> right on the bottom of the video? While we're on the part of of like Punisher, do you remember when Pun died, and what was that like in the city? I do remember when Pun died, but. Um, what year was that? Or what about like big? Like which? Like <laughs> so what? I tell you, I tell you. What big rapper? So, so Scribble's album, Traffic Jams, puns on the album, and Pun was really big at the time. It was, it was a little bit before he died, and in the studio, he had to sit in the in the booth because if he stood up, he was out of breath. So he had to sit down to record his his verse, and it's fire. Pun was unbelievable, but you know. This was towards the tail end. I think uh, Traffic Jams 2000 was the name of it. That's why I can get the year right. Mm. So I, I think <laughs> Pun died a couple years after that. Well, actually, Traffic Jams 2000 was the second one, so I was wrong. Mm. Traffic Jams Volume One, whatever year that was, um, Pun was on it, and uh, that's it was it was super sad. You know, one of the best branded things was Pun as Jordan. Did you ever see that? No, what's that? Oh my God, he came out with a record. I don't know which record it was, but the the logo and the branding was pun the the Jordan logo with his you know big ass body yeah that's hysterical hilarious. oh snap oh yeah. shit yo that's crazy that that is that's how like Kung Fu Panda <laughs> yo, the way name, before that the name of his album was Traffic Jams get it it's a big pun no no it wasn't his oh Scribbles. my god oh Scribbles because he was oh. on a, on the morning show with Ed Lover and Dr Dre and Lisa G. For Hot 97. Bro, it's Kung Fu Panda. Yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah. It's Michael Jordan. <laughs> Yo, that's, that's crazy. Funny. Okay. All right. Uh, we got a couple things lined up. Um, all right, cool. So wait, real quick, Georgie, top three. Maybe it's guys you worked with, whatever. Rappers, all time, greatest, dead or alive. Top favorite three. top three? I don't know. Yeah, your favorite. Top three rappers. My top three is Biggie, Jay-Z, and DMX. That's to listen to. Yeah. Damn, said like a real Poughkeepsie man. That's yeah. that's Poughkeepsie, bro. Heard. So then let's talk about the business of it. Then we got uh, George just brought up Jay Z. Zach, if you want to read some of this off, these are the businesses that Jay Z owned stake in, or at, or at least at a time, uh, how he made his billion dollar empire. Jay Z. Uh, okay, Brooklyn Nets. Do say. I don't know. Do say. That's a Rock, li liquor. Yeah, yeah. It's that liquor. Okay. Rockefeller. Um, Rockefeller. Rockaware. Title. Uber. Uh, and that's it. Uber, he what's this? Two million, million, million in 2012. Asked me the his investment is now 70 million. Wow. Yeah, but I feel like that's almost nothing compared to Title and Brooklyn Nets and some of the other stuff he has. That just might be a big. Yeah, I mean that's just a sick return. Two to 70. Damn. Yeah, but he's also should have put Beyonce on there too, too. You know what I mean? Like it's not always necessarily his money. You with celebrities, they could be the forefront. And saying at 70, he put up 10 or 20, and other people put 50 up. But no one gives a fuck who they are. Mm. So, so that's, it. that's the investment, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, there's a deal, a back deal that no one knows about. Yeah. And what's crazy is that his name and his 
he's worth that much. Like people put up that money because they know that it's Jay Z and it's gonna blow up. Apparently, he's worth two point five bill. You want to hear Jay Z story? Yeah, I did. Okay, I ain't so, gonna say no. So I met Jay probably you know, six or seven times before this at nightclubs. I would go up to him back then because I'm, I'm young in the game, working working for Scribble and. Scribble was home, whatever dude he's doing, whatever he's doing. I was out, and I ran into Jay Z standing outside of his uh, his office one time because when I was servicing records, I was waiting for somebody, and uh, he came out and I, you know, I, I chopped it up with him real quick. And then in nightclubs, back then we had Skytel pagers, mm. and I'm like, Yo, Scribs, Jay Z, or whatever. And he's like, he sent him a message. And I'm like, Yo, what up, Jay? And fucking showed him a message again. This is just like, I'm young, I'm super young too, so just how you meet people and you're networking and it's like just it leading so up different. to you know the eventual time to have a real conversation and just you know pass by conversations you know everything's an elevator pitch exactly right so um years so this is funny i actually remember this year it was 2004 holy shit 20 years ago wow 20 years ago we were doing a gig for a big time stock guy who had his own firm and he would fly his people everywhere once a year for a you know, big a retreat type thing. It's 2004, 20 years ago. Um, Beyonce's sister got married in the Bahamas. So our friend Jesse Itzler, who That's started- That's my boy, I know him. Yeah, so Jesse's, my, Jesse's our guy. I haven't seen him in a long time, but 100%. Oh, God. We were supposed to have Big him on a podcast. Calendar. It never happened, but we were supposed to have him. Okay, so yeah. crazy. Jesse used to do, he was in the music business too, Jesse. Yeah, I remember. So, he made the song for the New York Knicks and exactly, everything. Exactly, so this, yeah. right yes. around that time, Scri I think Scribble did the scratches on that. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So Scribble and Jesse were friends, and, and you know I became friends with Jesse because of Scribble, obviously. Mm -hmm. And this stockbroken guy was a friend of, he's a friend of ours too, but I'm just going to say his name because it's unnecessary, but Jesse... Um, was his guy too. So Jesse started Marquis Jets and um, we're doing this private event for him in the Bahamas and Jesse was flying down. Jay-Z called Jesse and was like, you got any, you know, because again, what celebrities do is planes go in different places, they jump on them because mm -hmm. they can. Yep. Convenience. You know, so. Yeah, yeah. Use my name. <laughs> and then let's go. So, again, this is way before social media and everything, 2004, right? So, mm -hmm. um, on the way down, we didn't fly with them, so they all flew down to the Bahamas. Scribble had a gig Friday night, so him and me and his wife flew down Saturday morning, came down, did a couple parties for them, had a great time. Everyone's talking about how Jay-Z and Beyonce were on the plane ride down because Beyonce's sister got married in Newport, Bahamas, so they flew down and they took a little plane from there, so they just you know, piggybacked on a flight. So on the way home, it's Sunday night, uh, Obviously, we're a little disheveled from a, a great weekend in fucking the Bahamas, you know, celebrating. Feeling it. Mm -hmm. And there we are, and then boom. Because there, there was, you know, word that they were going to come, but no, there's no guarantee. There's never a guarantee with artists either because they show up or they don't show up. It's up on them, you know? Yeah. So they're supposed to be on a flight. <clears throat> so Scribble and Jay-Z obviously knew each other, and Beyonce too, because I had some uh, relation, you know, uh, shows with Beyonce when me and Scribble had, uh, a couple shows before with her. But um, we're flying back on this. It's a big plane, but it's private. And I'm sitting here. There's an empty seat here. The aisle's here. Beyonce's here. Jay's there. Beyonce's assistant. And Jay's their bodyguard, who's the size of a fucking wall. This guy is fucking <laughs> huge. I bet. And then in front of me is Scribble and his wife. And we're hanging out with bullshit and we're talking, whatever. You know, there's a table in, in, in the middle of us on the plane. And then, you know, halfway through the flight, this, this is actually a Beyonce story, not a Jay-Z story, guys, but. <laughs> we'll halfway, take it. We will take it. Don't worry. Like We're not upset. Flight, Beyonce's wearing like a, like a fur coat, right? Now, you know when you, you fall asleep on a flight, it gets fucking hot. Yeah. So she takes this fucking fur coat off. And I'm like, again, right here. And I always love Beyonce, you know. It is what it is. Jay, you got it, not me. I get it. <laughs> but the aisle's here. She's right there. Right where you are, Tony, almost. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she takes off this fur jacket, and she has a shirt on that's like around the top of her neck. And like, man, <laughs> I felt like I was in bed with the broad. Oh, my You know what I mean? Like, God. she was right there, like that close and gorgeous. Like, say my stunning, name, say my gorgeous. name when no one is around <laughs> you. So for the next couple of years, every time I seen it, that was the, the image that popped in my head. 
But it, you know, super cool. Jay was always cool. So you joined the Mile High Club that day? I wish. <laughs> it was another day. Beyonce used to. I mean, she's still beautiful, but back then, bro, we that did, was like seeing a goddess. Bro, so this was this was February 2004, so 20 years ago. A couple years before that, we did three shows in the same week with Destiny Child, mm. and. It's hard to walk up to one good looking fucking girl. You know what I'm saying? That's a star. And you're just like yeah, the, yeah. the worker. You know what I mean? I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Scribble's guy. You know what I'm saying? I handle the, the equipment at the time. So I seen them, three of them. They, you know, again, you see each other, you're passing backstage in the hallways, the, the dressing rooms, all that shit. And then that was like a, like a July, August, and then September. Uh, it was my 25th birthday, and it was the VMAs. And it was the first VMAs I went to, and it was fucking unbelievable, obviously. And, and then the after party, it was the most celebrities I ever seen in one fucking VIP. And they're right fucking there. I had a couple of drinks. I said, you know what? It's fucking time. I'm going to go over and say what's up, you know? And I went over and talked to them, and they were super sweet and super cool. Again, they seen me um, multiple so many times. times. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it wasn't like just walking up like Tony would and just say whatever to them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and with a funny joke. Uh, and know, he would have got him though too. Yeah, yeah he would have, <laughs> you know? But, you know, it was super cool. And then again, back then we were doing a lot of events, all like the radio promo shows and all the different, you know, acts were on them and stuff. So you got to show up one of the concerts. Like, it's how people do things. You know what I mean? Like, so if you got a lot of spins and, and the, the, the station supporting you, You'll come in and do the show for them, and they'll, you'll get a discounted price. Some do it for free, depending on how big they are, but a lot of them, that's how... You know. I feel like it, like all the old Summer Jam, right, all that stuff, stuff like that, that's how All that, that stuff was, was commitments, because gotcha. they, you're getting support from the radio station, so right. you got to support back. And that's how the radio station is able to get ticket sales and you know promote. You know, it's all, it's all one hand washes the other. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Interesting. I never knew that. Um... So let's check this out. Obviously, this is our guy, Jesse Itzler. Oh, shit. Um, let me switch. Watch the video. Here we go. This is Jesse Itzler talking about a deal, doing a deal for something. With all these guys in Coke and suits. And I called up A-Rod, Alex Rodriguez, who's the best player in baseball, playing for the Yankees, third base, hottest guy in New York. And I'm like, Rod, do you... He said Coke and suits. I, was, I thought I was at a wedding. <laughs> A rod. He wants shares in a coconut water company. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, man, I'm going to get this deal with Coca-Cola. All you got to do is come to my office at five o'clock. I'm going to be in a meeting. Come out of the elevator, knock on the glass. And I'm going to be like, I can't meet with you today, man. I'm going to call you back and get back in the elevator and leave. He's like, all right. Five o'clock comes. I'm in the middle of the meeting, like 505. The elevator comes up and I'm talking to the guys. The guy knocks on the door. He's like, I'm like, Hey, Rod, Rod, I can't do it now, man. I got a meeting. I, I'll call you at seven o'clock. He's like, cool. He gets back in the elevator. The guy from Coke is like, are you f kidding me? <laughs> Yo, he's like, that was smart. Alex Rodriguez. Yo, Yo he's a genius, crazy. bro. If you watch his videos, the first time I ever saw him was at 10X Growth Con, Grant Cardone in Miami at Marlin Stadium. And he was a speaker. And he was saying the most wild stories. He, I forget exactly the context, but he went to this event and he was trying to sell marquee jets at the time. And he was trying to get people to buy in his, it was like a, 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 a membership company for jets, right? And he couldn't get people to listen to him. He wasn't really that important and whatnot. And at lunch, everyone went over and was buying muffins from this one baker. That was the only spot you could buy muffins or buy anything at the break. That was the only spot you could buy anything at the break. And so after lunch, when he came back the next day, he didn't go into the show. He sat there. He bought every muffin in the entire place. And then he sat there. And at lunch, they all came and were like, yo, there's no muffins here. Jesse was like, I have all the muffins. I'll sell it to you as, as long as you let me pitch That's my jet thing to you, bro. And he sold like 10 jets that day, oh, do you, 10 memberships to jets. Do you understand how that worked? How that, no. The, the Marquee world, jets? Do you know how that blew up? Not exactly. I'm you. You probably know, bro. So Jesse and I, and I, I can't think of his partner's name right now. Another cool dude. They did jet monkeys jets right before nine eleven. Then fucking nine eleven happened, mm. and everyone went fucking private. Mm. They want to play public. It's crazy. 
That makes a lot of fucking sense. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. I almost just made yeah. a joke that I can't make. I almost did it. <laughs> but but I, I think Jesse's done a lot of amazing things, but the best thing he ever did was marrying his wife. Oh, yeah, Sarah Blakely. Bro. She's insane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Billion dollar Blakely? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, Oh, I know. It's crazy. insane. Did you did you listen to or read his book, uh, Living with a Seal? Yep, I read Living with a Seal. I've watched all the podcasts on him. What's the other one he wrote? Living with uh, Living with a monk when he went and lived with monks. Oh, I didn't know about that. Bro, he lived with bro. You don't know about that one? No, I don't. He lived with fucking monks for ninety days. Didn't speak and lived as a monk for ninety days. <laughs> That's crazy. And then <laughs> I did wrote not about know that. Yeah, that guy's insane. He's, yeah, he's, he's like, like one of my favorite people on earth. He's a good dude. He's insane. He's good his the, just the way he th- processes issues and like thinks of solutions it's just the most extreme did you ever scenarios. take one of his courses no i never took one i bought I his big ass calendar i can get you i'll get you a course if you want i would love to yeah for sure yeah i would totally would i'll take one too we, we sure? were, de- <laughs> make it sure? we were, de- we were dming one. on instagram and he was supposed to come on the podcast and then it never happened and then we were going to do it again and it didn't happen again but yeah i've been trying to get him on the podcast it's really dope i did it it's really dope the a- course. Any thoughts on? Uh, yeah, I bought big ass calendar too leveraging. before I even knew who he was. The big really? one you yeah, put. Yeah, that in. came that, that came out after I did the course. Yeah. Um, but it, it's dope. He's 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 the real deal. Yeah. That yeah, video reminds me of this thing I saw online once of like how to position things, right? So it was like this crazy idea this guy wrote out, and it was this concept of how to put your son in a better position. So this guy calls up. It was like a weird example, but he called up like this queen and said, I, you know, your daughter is single. My son is the CEO of this huge company. Let's get them together, right? Let's put them together. Let's arrange a marriage. And then he, at the same time, the son didn't have the CEO job. So he called the huge company. He's like, yo, make my son the CEO. He's married to a princess. And he had neither of the two positions, but because the, because the other one may have <laughs> yeah, existed, yeah, yeah. he put the two together. Yeah. So he got his son a CEO <laughs> position and married a princess yeah. from, <laughs> just from propositioning. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> like Moneyball, like agents in the MLB, right? They'll be like, I- I'll trade you this person for this much money. Exactly. And then you call the other person. They're like, yo, this person's going to buy this person. And then yeah, you go back yeah, and forth yeah. and they end up with the deal that that's they want. That's a great movie. Yeah. Oh, great my movie. God. That's, that's the that's best like, movies uh, ever. You know what else that reminds me of? People are getting in, uh, well, people aren't getting in trouble, but did you know that people are betting on the Super Bowl saying there's going to be a streaker, right? I see Hundreds that. Hundreds of thousands the of guy dollars. did, he bet on himself. Is that he true? He bet on it's himself. True. Is it true? And then he jumped on the field. 347,000. I know. I was going to do it next to my friends. <laughs> he's he's going to get out of it. All that he's coming back, though. Yeah, we have to do three or four people to change it up, change the bet. Oh, okay. You know what I'm saying? Hey, they, they I'm there. 347. Bet on an amputee. You know the odds? Oh my God. One in a billion. Yo, but I guarantee that guy doesn't be, he's not going to be allowed to keep the money because he posted about it. You don't think they're going to fucking sue him? I don't know if he posted back? or someone posted. But is it even real? Come inside. It's all going to be connected. Go. All right, so this is, this is a highlight reel. Yeah, tee it up. Uh, yeah, there's a, a, a scribble highlight reel like before we even blew the fuck up, right? So... This just give you guys some context because uh, this is 1998, 99. How old are you guys? Were you born? I was born in 1998. Yeah. So, I was born in 98. Yeah, facts. Look at this. So this is uh, in Miami. Puffy called him to, to DJ for Mace. That's when I seen J-Lo. Pause that for a second. So we were in Miami. Puffy called. Uh, Danny was Puffy. Not Diddy. Puffy called Scribble. Mace needed a DJ. So Scribble came to the Miami arena to DJ for Mace. And that's what they're doing on stage. And now I'm backstage and I'm walking. And all of a sudden, I'm like, holy shit, look at that ass. <laughs> I turn around, it's J-Lo. No. J-Lo, before the world knew Puffy was with J-Lo. Don't be fooled I knew. by the box that I got. I knew. And J-Lo is always... On the top of my list, like Beyonce was second to J Lo on my list. Yo, this on tattoo right here of this broad here was supposed to be J Lo, but my friends took me out of it. That was gonna be J Lo on on Stuff magazine cover. That was supposed to be her right there. That she's actually posing similar to J Lo on that cover. So that's what that was in Miami. Yo, I love the stories, bro. Are we just about to get 
to show you a little highlight from my life. You guys one of the baddest DJs in the land. DJ Sinbad. Yeah, Sinbad. It's funny. Not the apple juice. Facts. Getting it. Oh, that's a 40. Oh, that's apple juice inside that 40. Yeah, on TV you can do the drink. See my man Squiggy, he was the local DJ in Elmont where I was just moved out of Queen. And he used to rock the local parties and some of the local clubs. And when I seen him DJ, it's something that I always wanted to do. You were out here with him? George, you were out here with him in not this, this day. Not this no, day. No, but I'm but saying was... in 99. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's the album right there that was promoting the album. That was a group he was in before he was on his own. Five white guys. And tell us a little bit. Teenagers. Tell us like what, what your relationship was like with, with Scribble and how you guys like, what you guys were doing at the top, at the highest level of what you guys were doing. Uh, you and Scribble. Uh, Spring break and let, shit. Let's, let, let, let's let the guys see this and then I'll, then I'll chat up with whatever you want me to. I want them to see this. So mm. this, this is That's brandy, this, guys. This is Jamaica. This is right when spring break started blowing up. Like this was like second year, third year, something like that. But this is where it changed. This is Jamaica, and then it transitioned to Cancun after that, and that's when we ran. Jerry so. Spring. I was just gonna say, who was that? Carmen Electra. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Does Jay Z too, guys? Bro, that this was, was a Mariah era. Carey, Cisco. Terrence. Damn. No, we did the show in Jamaica, and I did the grind, and then MTV offered me to do a summer show called The Daily Burn. Hey! Ha! Ha! What's up, everybody? My name is DJ Scribble. My job was to set up his equipment there back then. So all the equipment he's DJing on, I got up there early in the morning, and set it all up, make sure everything works, sound checked and everything, and then hung out the whole fucking day until it was done and packed it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good gig right there. I miss the 90s, bro. Oh, God. That was Red Man. Outcast. Outcast, yeah. Fubu, he was wearing Fubu. The DMX. Fubu jersey. DMX. Jay Z. Tyrese. Scribble Loki looks like a young Joe Rogan. <laughs> uh, I'm that fucking <laughs> Scribble pl the thing up fucking 400,000 times. Biz Marquis, yeah. Tell us about the time with MTV and Spring Break. Tell us all about that. Get us into that mode. Where we at? MTV was in Jamaica, and it was it was cool. It was whatever. Then they transitioned to Cancun, and it was a game changer. So, in Cancun, they came down there. They bring all the talent down there, and during the day is when MTV shot. It was daytime shit. You see, it's you know daytime at night. Ain't no one got nothing to do. Me and my guys were in Cancun the year before MTV even got there. And we were already doing nightclub stuff, promoting stuff. My guy Chris Rita did Palladium, Limelight, USA, all the big major nightclubs in New York back then in the 90s. Chris was involved with uh, a couple of partners, Joy e and uh, Carmine. <clears throat> so we went down to Cancun separately actually and we're exploring on our own, and then we came up with the idea, well, let's do fucking parties down here. And we connected with a tour company, and we booked tours throughout our network of people to come to Cancun. And then because we had a relationship, but at the time, we had the relationship with MTV because of Scribble, I did, but they had an, their own relationships. So when the artist came down to, to Mexico, like I said, there was nothing to do. So we then booked them in nightclubs. We reserved the nightclubs and booked the artists at a very low price compared to what they normally get because they're there and there's they're nowhere else to go. There there's anyway. no, there's yeah. no competition. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? So they would come, and I'm talking everyone from Eminem, Snoop, Dre, fucking 50 eventually. Um, anyone, again, I'm bad with the, the list, but anyone that was on MTV in, in spring break, 
If they weren't performing, they were hanging out because we had the best parties. It was NYC on the move was that's the, was a the vibe, party, bro. Party. That's yeah. that's crazy. crazy. We did it for a decade. That's a vibe. A decade. And you were at the head of that? No, I was part of. I was you know the Voltron. I was part of it. I always say what's real and not real. You know what I mean? Like so, I, I work with talent. I work with MTV. So my guys would bring the talent because they would be the ones paying. I would bring MTV staff, have my list, and have someone at the door, make sure they're all good, and he would say my name, or walk them in, whatever it was, because I was, like I said, I would set up in the morning. I'd set up as, I had to be there early before everybody, hung over, <laughs> set up his <laughs> Every shit. Every time. You know, sometimes <laughs> late, and, and, and uh, people would be mad at me, but it'd get done. <laughs> TV's funny, because it's like, hurry, hurry, hurry up, and then wait. You know what I'm saying? Like, hurry, hurry, hurry and up wait. and wait. Yeah. During the day, I set them up. He's working. They're all working. I would pour liquor into Gatorade bottles, Snapple bottles, whatever it was, and then come out and give it to different stage managers or different people on crew really that taking I knew. Care of the crew. And on camera, the directors and everybody didn't see me doing anything wrong. They Greasing. See me just, you know, again, networking. Playing a game, networking. baby. Playing chess. <laughs> What I what I would what I would be doing nothing that was work for me have fun you know what right, I mean like right. I like my whole life if you you know, you know Damon always says some things up and a couple of things I want to make people fucking smile yeah sir enjoy themselves Preach. be happy spread love that's what I'm about right so they would be working a hot grueling fucking day take fucking 2000 with all these fucking kids acting up and i'd hit them with a fucking nice cold drink nice cold gatorade eight <laughs> percent they loved it right so at night everyone looked to me what to do yeah. obviously you know so that's when i'd bring them to the to the clubs that we were doing there was other competition in cancun but we had the the, the, the lockdown the real shit in the beginning mm -hmm. you know and then as it grew, other people came in, and then fucking in the bidding wars came in. Yeah, you just that. don't see shit like that. No, anymore. how do you compare you the just, scenes of yeah, today to like, back oh, then? It's not even man. close. It's right? not. Yeah, guys, it's unfortunate. Guys, I could put like four other guys in a room and, and we can talk, and they will blow your fucking mind. All right, line it up about the shit. All right, we know you got a good story. You have to have a good story with that. So one a memory I have from that trip that's pretty fucking. You, you know, unique is I, my, my job always was to just to think about how to fucking make money, how to can grow, how to, you know, do things. Right. So I walked around with a little handheld black organizer and all the people I met, I had them fucking put their name and address down because back then we sent flyers out to everybody. Like we go to Cancun with, 5,000 flyers for all our parties. And everyone bring three boxes, two boxes, whoever's carrying them. And then walk the beaches and walk around and hand to that hand. That still happens though down there. Yeah, but yeah. like, yeah, but we that was, was it. We there was no it. Instagram yeah. or yeah, guys, Facebook. Like what I'm saying to you is like, we were the beginning. In Mexico, they didn't do what we did because we brought it from New York. Like I'm, I'm dead serious when I say me and my friends did it first. And that's the difference between social media and especially with my, my life with Scribble. You know, because I, you know, Scribble was one part of it. Like my nightlife stuff with my boys was, was, was different. It was just different. We had guys from all the boroughs, you know, from guys from the Bronx, guys from Brooklyn, guys from Staten Island. We were the Queens guys. And we would come and set up and fucking wreck shop and, you know, do things that no one ever did before. The guerrilla marketing, Mexico never seen it before. Because we're from New York. The guerrilla marketing is what we created over here. And then we did it in Cancun. Then we did it in Vegas. We did it in Vegas, again, before everybody was doing it. You know, like, that's nightlife and party shit. You know, where, again, we would book the acts, the DJs, and all the crowds would come. So you were telling us about the first year, right? That was the first year. But take us to the, it, just for the sake of like telling the stories and saving time and whatever, just like tell us about like the, like a crazy story from being at spring break over the decade that you were doing it. Like take, take us to that era whenever, doesn't matter when. Um, Do you want to tell us the Tommy Lee thing? 
Tommy Lee is crazy. I saw him once, twice live. He did the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. He took a, so we were at Nikon Theater and we're in the middle of a show. They're in between songs, Motley Crue, obviously. And Tommy Lee takes a camera that's connected to the Jumbotrons and he walks backstage with it and it's Tommy Lee. So the first thing he does is pull his hog out. It looks like a fucking baby's arm holding an apple. It's huge. So I feel like a woman. And then he comes back out to the stage and he says two magic words. He goes, titty cam. And he aimed it at the audience. And it was like women's shirts were on fire. They were ripping them off. And I'm like 18 years old. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? It was the coolest thing I had ever seen. Every chick in the audience's titties were out. It was wild. I mean, Lee can do yeah, anything he's a party women. Yeah. Yeah. So Real rock star. So Super Bowl 2007 in Arizona, we're out there. I'm with uh, one of my guys, DJ Riz, and uh, we do uh, – Riz, I think Sis might have been there too, or Finesse. I think it might have been all fucking three of them. I'm not sure. But we're doing the Bud Bowl for my buddy Steve Levine in Arizona, and a Bud Bowl was a big outdoor concert. And we did that. We were done. And then we went to Access Radius to, uh, I think he was Puffy still. I don't know if he was Diddy yet. His party. And we're hanging out in VIP, just chilling. And Tommy Lee and Arrow. Arrow's one of my good homies. And he was Tommy's DJ when Tommy did um, DJ sets. Tommy did, played house music. So Tommy played house music. That's crazy. Yeah. Remember. So we one of the agencies I work with, we did... Uh, the, like the secondary shit for fucking rock stars like Dave Navarro used to do a drum set with a DJ with my guy Slinky and Scribble and Tommy Lee would do a DJ set with Arrow they would fucking do four turntables and do their you know not four turntables they would do turntables and do crazy shit so Tommy and Arrow were there and we were all hanging out and, and Tommy was actually dating uh, Jermon the Kid you know who Jason Kidd is? no mm -hmm. you fucking guys are so Jason. Jason yes Kittis? yes yes you guys are so fucking young <laughs> Hey, I know Jason Kidd. Okay, <laughs> in Arizona, we're on a VIP hanging out and Diddy's fucking thing, and we're walking through the hotel lobby and Stoop security guards come over and say, yo, guys, uh, t -t Tommy, why don't you come up and say what's up to Snoop? So Tommy went up for like the first, him and Jamondi went up for the first 15 minutes, and then uh, they you know, came down like, yo, come up. So we went up, me, Arrow, Riz, um, Sis, and then my boy, uh, Richie, who was a uh, like a crazy BMX guy, like doing the flips, like Tony Hawk shit, like crazy dude. We all went up smoking weed with Snoop. That was the first time I actually smoked with Snoop. And his in his you know sweet dope ass room playing fucking new music. It was super fucking dope. When you're with Snoop, even if you don't sm smoke or if you never smoked, you wind up smoking because you're with Snoop. So Jamanda, who never smoked weed in her whole fucking life, smoked weed. Tommy, who was more of an upper, not a downer, smoked some weed. We were also with Viggy, uh, Tommy's guy, who was a fucking dynamite motherfucker. Rest in peace, Viggy. Died, you know, this last year. All hanging out, smoking. Funny shit, Richie was like a born-again Christian. Like, new. Like, fucking brand new, born-again Christian guy. He left the fucking room and fucking left Vegas. He was like, I'm fucking done with all this shit. I can't be here. He just left, which was fucking hysterical. From smoking? Because he got that high? Uh, he didn't smoke. He, he just, just like, there. you know, he was, you know, a new found, you know, God dude. So it was like, this is not where I need to be. And it was just funny. Like, he didn't say goodbye to nobody. He just left the room and then told us he went home, you know, the next day. <laughs> like, just literally went to the airport. Got a flight and left. It was mm. the fucking weirdest shit, but mm. whatever. So we all smoked, listened to music, hung out. And then when we left the fucking room, me and Viggy had to carry fucking Tommy Lee to the limo because he was fucked up. Because like I said, up is and down is two different games. You know what I'm saying? So had to carry him to the fucking car and walk him down the hotel fucking lobby, uh, the hotel hallway. And Jamanda never smoked weed in life, and she's fucking hysterical. <laughs> she's laughing, Yo. she's jumping around, and just having a fucking best time of her life. And Tommy Lee totally different reactions of high right. and low, you right. know. And uh, 
That's crazy. Imagine carrying a rock star because he's too high. Yeah, that's That insane. doesn't happen. That's Only like... Only you, bro. Yeah. You no, know, Viggy probably done a lot more times than me. Yeah. You know, that was his guy. With you know? Tommy. But it was, again, for me too, it was amazing. All of it was amazing. Like, I was not... You know, I was blown away by this shit happening. How'd you carry Tommy? Happening. Did you carry him by his handle? <laughs> <laughs> No dick, <laughs> pun intended. It was so over, arm over the shoulder for clarity. He's tall. Yeah, he is tall <laughs> on his back. Do you know about it? I saw it on a uh, camera. How many times? On the you on watched the it a lot, didn't you? Oh no, not the, uh, not the film. I'm talking about at the concert that I was just telling you about. Oh, you never seen Pam it? You never seen Pam and fucking him? The fucking uh, video? maybe. I, don't know. I watched it. Yeah, everyone. Probably watched like it. when it the whole world watched it. You know that fucking crazy story. It was before the fucking internet. It was just internet just started when that shit yeah, blew he up. He pretty much boom. He made the internet boom. Yeah, it was crazy. In your opinion, of all these these masterminds of business and, and rappers at that too, who's who do you think is in, in my the opinion? Forefront? Yes, yeah. in my opinion, what Fifty has done is amazing. Obviously. You can go bank accounts, Dr. Dre, billion dollar, yeah, whatever. I about you know Dr. what I mean? Dre. Like and and Diddy before the drama and Don't forget about Snoop. Snoop. Snoop for with sure. Martha my guy. Stewart, bro. But, Working with yeah, Martha crazy. Stewart. Snoop's That's everywhere. crazy. But in my opinion, Fifty is that guy. Because what he does, he stays relevant. Like musically, obviously his old jams are his jams. And with the history of hip hop, older as you get older. You don't always connect. That's why Fat Joe is different. His songs still connect. Mm. Because now you're a millionaire or whatever, chilling, doing, doing what you're doing. You're not connecting to the kids that are in the struggle and, and doing what they, 50 did in the beginning. So that's why when he shows up, he does those records and they, they go crazy. But his strategy, his, his film production, TV production, when he's done, when, and I've seen him in interviews where he says, I can make money while I'm sleeping. You know what I'm saying? That's the fucking goal all the time for mm. everybody doing anything. So Snoop 50 is on the top of my list because he's from Queens and I respect the dude and, and he's on my list to, to, to get to do, do some shows for me and, you know, connect with him. Got you, got you. Now tell us a little bit more about Snoop D-O-double-G. Well, that dude, he's a genius. He's a genius in what he does, like the connector with Martha Stewart. How can you be so does. smart and so high at the same time? Bro, weed is from God and the earth. It elevates you. Yeah. It elevates you, heard you it here first. to think of things that you are thinking about in a, in a, in a sober frame you of mind. You know, when I used to smoke weed and I was younger before they were have been working on it and making it so strong. I used to love it. We used to smoke and freestyle and hang out and like yeah, draw. Buddy, but you can still get it from the farms. You don't have to go through your local dealer. Let's talk about Snoop. Bring me back to SNOOP. Back to Snoop business-wise, a genius. And what, again, what I seen happen from COVID. So I booked DJ Snoop Adelic a couple of times. So what artists do as well, like I was telling you before about the radio promotion shows, is that they find like alter egos to make more money in the market. So you do a show as Snoop, big concert, sold out arena, and now that's done at 11 o'clock. Now what do I do? Snoop the magician. Snoop Adelic. <laughs> that's crazy. DJ Snoop Mixing Adelic. Mixing tracks. Comes to the club. Yep. DJ's tracks. But he on the mic, he'll... he'll do a couple records over his songs, but in the contract, he just has to play records. That's his preference of what he does song-wise. But it also, to other songs that are dope on the mic, if he's having a good time, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's fucking, it's dope. It's a dope fucking show for the price, it brings the fucking people and everything's fucking great. So what happened with COVID is, Everything, everyone was on fucking line doing shit. So after COVID, when I tried to book him, the price went fucking up again because they're like, he don't need to leave. We were always piggybacking on other gigs, but they were like, he don't need to leave his home because he's making so much money on the metaverse. Oh, so you, no, they, you meant, you mean streaming. Streaming. 
No, both, both. Streaming and metaverse. You got to put them in a hotel that's fucking very good fucking Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi like top level Wi-Fi. And he's going to stream and play games while he's at the hotel that's chilling crazy. out, right? No, people got fucking, you know, red jelly beans or whatever. But Snoop was like, at the hotel. And, and it's not easy to find a hotel with fucking sick quality Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, so that's a, a challenge at times, but it gets fucking worked out. So, but he does that all the time. So if he's doing the gig, he's still doing the streaming shit. Yeah. But the COVID shit created the metaverse extra streaming shit where he's right. making big dough. Right. And this all is compiled to all the other shit that he did with Martha Stewart and all the other shit. So it's all leading up to like a funnel effect to these things. So now he don't got to leave his house unless it's you know half a million to leave his house. Quarter million, you know, it all depends on who's booking it. So, so a booker could have two or three shows and get it for a quarter of a million and do three shows, and it's you know a third for him. Or if you're just coming for one show, you need a half a million. Like it, it varies in that aspect. Everyone brings something to the table. If it's something for a good show, then the price varies. But he was making so much money at his crib. Which you is don't even have to leave. It's it's not a crib. It's a fucking huge resort, fucking place. Where's that? Cali, Cali somewhere. Cali, yeah, yeah. It's you, crazy. You've been there a couple times. I have not been there yet. I was oh, invited, no. yeah. but I just haven't been there yet. Kev, you know, white boy Kev is his guy. Is who I deal with. My guy for for years, even before he worked with fucking Snoop, I knew him from the firm when he worked for the firm. Super, super, super fucking cool dude. All right, let's uh, let's look at. Some clips of uh, Snoop's brilliant business moves. Let's get everybody's opinion. So when I throw this up, just um, like you guys on set, please feel free to like shout out. Be like, go, oh, what the fuck? Or stop it or tell me to stop or rewind or whatever. Okay. Yep. Here we go. So we got a, a recent campaign. For good. Today he posted a statement on social for media. Snoop. After Much consideration and conversation with my family, I've decided to give up smoke. He went on to ask fans to respect his privacy at this time. Please respect my privacy. One of the most famous people in the world. This shit was crazy. Respect my privacy. I fucking believed it. Like, I was like, what the fuck is going on? You know what I mean? I never thought that was a fucking play. I just thought it was like, yeah. what the fuck is going on? So another fucking uh, story with Snoop is, so I had Snoop at a strip club, right? So <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. all right, you want to tell this or you want to like analyze this business thing a little bit? No, let, let him tell rock. No, tell the beginning of that sentence was I had Snoop at a strip club. We're every, letting him rock. You know, every time I had Snoop was at a strip club, just so you know. What? So did it have good Wi Fi? <laughs> the hotel did. Yeah, yeah. no. That's so, crazy. So you could you could even back this up with, with fucking like TMZ shit. So at the end, Snoop was super cool, fucking smoking, everyone's fucking smoking the whole fucking time. I don't know how to do, I don't know if he smokes super fucking weed or regular weed because he smokes the whole fucking time. So if you're smoking super weed all that time, you got to be fucked up, you know, like to, <laughs> to, to blend records and fucking sing, like it's crazy. So I think he might down the fucking weed down a little bit during shows, just between you and me. You think he's got <laughs> uh, tobacco in there a lot? I don't think tobacco. I smoked, I, you know, because- when Snoop is fucking smoking, you're like, oh, let me get the fucking blood. So you, you, everyone on stage is trying to smoke with Snoop, he's not just around immune. him. He's probably immune to it. Maybe too, you, maybe I too. But, to I mean but, but I've smoked the blunts, you know, you know, I've smoked the blunts and I was like, oh, that's just like regular shit. That ain't fucking Snoop. But he's on stage, so maybe he's got to focus. But anyway, after the fucking performance, right? After the performance, all the girls are on stage and they want to take photos with him. So he's taking photos. And, you know, fucking one girl, two girl, three girls, a bunch of fucking girls. There's a hundred girls working tonight in the club with two performs. So the next fucking day, I don't know if it's TMZ or what fucking platform is fucking trying to stir up shit. Snoop's cheating on his wife. You know what I mean? Like, it was totally just photos in a strip club. Right, right, right. He left with his crew. None of the girls went to the hotel. None of the bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they turned it into fucking Snoop is fucking cheating on his wife. Oh, man. And you could definitely pull it up. And Anything they, for a headline, bro. That's what they do. You know of what I'm course, saying? So, of course. Again, I was there. 
He went fucking home. I was staying at the fucking same hotel. Damn, George, Not that, you're, you're a good you know, friend, George. He had yeah. to put that out there. Snoop, for my you man. did Snoop. good, buddy. My boy Snoop, Georgie's got you. Snoop, we Finish know up you, that clip. Snoop, we know you don't love them hoes. <laughs> <laughs> I have an announcement. I'm, I'm giving, giving up, up smoke. smoke. I know I what you're thinking. thinking. Snoop, smoke, smoke is kind of your whole thing. thing. But I'm, I'm done, done with it. Done, done with the coughing and my clothes smelling all sticky. I'm going smokeless. Solo stove fix. Wait, I had this fucking thing too. Yeah. Solo stove. Yeah, dope as shit. My friend has it too. It's Yo, dope as shit. They work. No, that shit works. You do, the smoke don't go all out. It stays in. It goes straight up, and there's like almost no smoke at all. But the smoke that comes out. Goes if he straight doesn't up, light up a blunt by the end of this commercial, I'm pissed. No, bro, you don't know. This? You don't know about this. <laughs> I didn't see the commercial. He. <laughs> Yo, he's funny, Yo, that shit's bro. legit though, for real. He's that funny. Thing I know, legit. I've used it, I've seen it too. It's, yeah. it's crazy. Clever. So do you do you see like most things? So back in the day when we were on MTV, when when Scribble would wear all the FUBU gear and whatever we would get, MTV got hip to it, like, fuck that. Pay us. So he mm. stopped all that. But back then, you see him in that in that highlight reel wearing fucking FUBU three different times. Where Fubu with all the other clothing brands would just give you clothes for the opportunity to be on thing mm. on TV, mm -hmm. and then the MTV would, would blur it out if it wasn't approved. That's but crazy. there was in that one highlight reel, which again was before Skrill even did all the shit we did. He had three different Fubu things on: a Fubu shirt, two jerseys. Speaking one, of, oh, go ahead. yeah, go ahead. speaking of Fubu stuff. I heard you came through like Santa Claus tonight. Mm. Bro, I've been known to look like Santa Claus before. <laughs> I wasn't saying all that. No, 100%. I, just I, I used you to were be bringing... a little bigger and I used to I used to do a charity thing where I'd collect clothes and, and toys and bring them to uh, the Bronx in uh, daycares and, and, and donate the clothes. And funny story, one of my friends, one of my producer DJ guys, DJ Moody and his wife, uh, uh, G. Marie, we would fuck around and tell their kids, they had two twins and, and the son Christopher and the girls, that I was Santa Claus's cousin. You better be fucking doing your shit right. <laughs> otherwise, Saint Georgie. Yeah. Georgie otherwise Claus. you'll be in trouble for Christmas. It was hysterical when we used to do that. And yeah, get rid of the old toys and shit. That's funny, bro. And you got but the yeah. red hat on today. And I've been good. I've been very good. So I think I deserve something. I don't know. So I did bring some stuff per Damon. Per DM? Per DM, for DJ, some classic Dang. Fubo, some classic Dang. Fubo. Yeah, Come on, flexible. son. Sandy came through. Oh, what's up, son? Thank you, DJ. Thank. It's coming out in April. It's early. Thank you, bro. But Thank you. Appreciate you. I wanted to give you something. Damon said. You don't want to see my fucking Hudson Valley pain in the ass fucking guy? 